debate to reprise the debate, the honourable member for Calgary, Rocky Ridge. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Madam Speaker, the new Liberal government promised greater transparency, economic responsibility and growth for the middle class. While these are laudable goals, which those on the Conservative benches certainly share, Budget 2016 falls far short of these aspirations. Despite aiming to boost GDP growth, Budget 2016 introduces measures which are either unrelated to growth or actually hinder growth. Despite its self-described goal of growing the middle class, Budget 2016's deficits form a burden on the middle class. Despite claiming to promote accountability, Budget 2016 is built of broken promises. Uh, allow me to begin with the effect of the deficit on Canada's debt-to-GDP ratio. During the 2015 campaign, among a litany of uh, other promises, the Liberals offered to run a modest deficit while lowering Canada's debt-to-GDP ratio. The deficit has since ballooned from the surplus, which the Conservatives left, right through the promised so-called modest deficit of only $10 billion. Uh, meanwhile, the debt-to-GDP ratio has risen to a projected 32.5% in 2016. This brings me to two more broken promises. Contrary to its promise to return to surplus by the end of its mandate, the government is projecting deficits right through 2020. Not only does this break the promise of eventual surplus, it breaks the promise to run modest deficits of only $10 billion. Every single year in the government's term, it projects a deficit well over $10 billion. While calculating the deficit, the Liberals appear to have deliberately understated GDP growth estimates by $40 billion. By setting such a low baseline against which to measure future progress, the government is engaging in financial trickery. Even the Parliamentary Budget Office, the nonpartisan fiscal watchdog, disagrees with the government's projection as unrealistically low. Instead of being transparent and easy to understand, setting an unrealistically low starting point, uh, perhaps in order to claim greater success than the real economic numbers support, is confusing and deceptive. It also gives the Liberals a chance to direct higher than expected revenues right back into spending instead of using them to reduce the deficit or pay down federal debt. This number fudging is mere political posturing, Mr. and Madam Speaker. This is not prudent planning, and it's certainly not evidence-based policy. This raises yet another broken promise, that of the promise for infrastructure spending. When campaigning, the Liberals offered to run a $10 billion deficit to pay for infrastructure to stimulate greater economic growth. Indeed, this was the principal promise of the platform upon which the Liberals were elected. Canadians could be forgiven for thinking that that actually meant $10 billion worth of spending on infrastructure, not a mere $3.4 billion over five years uh, to be spent on productive measures like public transit that we would support. The rest of the deficit is going to various other Liberal priorities. Not only is the spending on actual infrastructure lower than promised, the premise of kick-starting sluggish growth has now been undermined as well. Although the economy contracted in the first half of 2015, it grew more than the market expected in the second half of the year. The dip in early 15 was due more to the collapse in commodity prices than to sluggish fundamentals. Despite the government's hope, social infrastructure spending in Canada will not counteract the challenges faced in the resource sector. In contrast, not killing or stalling pipeline projects like Northern Gateway in Energy East would actually benefit Canada and grow our GDP. Instead, the Liberals introduced a moratorium on tanker traffic on northern British Columbia's coast, thus blocking Northern Gateway, uh, which was approved under the previous Conservative government. The Liberals are also moving the goalposts on the Energy East approval process. Not only does this not improve Canada's GDP, it actually deters new investment by creating uncertainty which is exacerbated by the Prime Minister's remarks whenever he travels outside Canada. Speaking of promised measures which do not grow GDP, Madam Speaker, the government plans to spend $5 billion over five, $5 billion over five years on so-called green infrastructure. Other so-called green initiatives such as working toward a national carbon tax will directly harm GDP. Conservatives have been warning for years that a tax on carbon dioxide emissions is a tax on everything. 
pushing for carbon taxes and subsidizing unreliable renewals like wind and solar, which require 100% redundancy for cloudy and calm days, does not address Canada's long-term energy needs. A prosperous and sustainable economy requires abundant, clean and inexpensive energy. Madam Speaker, I would like to remind the government that pipelines are infrastructure too. Indeed, they are the best kind of infrastructure, the kind which produces many well-paying and highly skilled jobs and are financed by private money and which address uh, a pressing need for both the short and the long term. If the government wants to kickstart more economic growth, I encourage them to facilitate these pipeline projects without further delay. Moving on to another means of stimulating the economy, Madam Speaker, one of the best ways to grow GDP is to encourage small and medium-sized enterprises to expand. And one of the best ways of attracting new small and uh, medium-sized enterprises and encouraging existing ones is through reasonable corporate tax rates. The government says that it understands this, but it is not acting on it. Mr. Speaker, on page 254 of the budget, the government acknowledges that corporate tax cuts produce the strongest economic growth in the long term. Yet, uh, the Liberals are breaking another campaign promise, their promise to lower the small business tax rate to 9%. Mr. Speaker, it's fundamentally dishonest for a party to promise a deficit to fund infrastructure in order to boost GDP, then direct most of its new spending to unrelated measures while taking steps that actually impair growth. Such dishonesty puts the lie to another Liberal promise that of more open, accountable, and transparent government. Mr. Speaker, the new Liberal government repeatedly boasts of its plan to be open and transparent. However, it is taking steps which directly contradict this lofty aim. Upon taking office, the government immediately stopped enforcing the First Nations Financial Transparency Act. Canada's Indigenous peoples receive much in the way of federal funding, but no longer have a legal claim to information on how their chiefs and councils spend it. The Liberals' plan to spend just over $2 billion on social infrastructure in Indigenous communities with no accountability to the residents. My Conservative colleagues and I recognize that there are many issues in Indigenous communities that the government can and should address, such as the boil water advisories, which are a national disgrace. We support tackling such problems, but Mr. Speaker, we also know that fixing a problem today with no accountability for tomorrow means fixing it again in the future. Continuing to an issue of vital importance for Canada's democratic future, on page 209 of the budget, the government has set aside $10.7 million over four years for outreach and awareness regarding electoral reform, but no money for a referendum. Mr. Speaker, shall we expect funds for a referendum in a future budget, or is the government planning to change the way that Canadians select their representatives without directly asking them? Open and transparent government demands putting such a pivotal question to the voters. Moving on to one last point about transparency, Ms. Madam Speaker. The Liberals made several commitments in their 2015 election platform, which will cost a great deal to implement, but which they have, have not been included in this budget. How are Canadians to know what their government plans to spend when it comes to implementing all the recommendations of the recent Truth and Reconciliation Commission without having calculated the cost. How can Canadians know what the deficit or surplus will be in the coming years when the government is faced with negotiating a new health accord with high tax and spending provinces? Will the government reduce spending to accommodate these new expenses? Will it saddle future generations with higher taxes by borrowing to fund them? Or will these just be additional broken promises? To conclude, Madam Speaker, Budget 2016 demonstrates one deception after another. It demonstrates that the government misled Canadians in the 2015 election campaign regarding the purpose of running a deficit, with the, course of such a, the course that such a deficit would take, the effect of a deficit on Canada's debt-to-GDP ratio, the efficacy of the measures the deficit was incurred to fund, and on the commitment to openness and transparency. Madam Speaker, 2016 is a budget built of broken promises.